now. Okay, so welcome everybody. So we have two talks today. One is about IoT, time series data, and uh, deep learning. And the second one is a very advanced talk about deep learning and neural networks. So I hope you enjoy. We are also recording the session and make the session available to all those who responded on the meetup. So I will send out this link later. Um, I work for IBM. So I work for the IBM Watson IoT business unit. And our headquarter is the first one which is outside US. It's actually in Munich. And I'm in uh, Switzerland, in Basel. Okay. Uh, so why are we talking about IoT now? So currently we have 15 billion connected IoT devices. And it is predicted that by 2020, we will have 40 billion. And if you contrast that to the world's population, you see that there are multiple IoT devices per person on the planet soon. So that's one reason why IBM is in the IoT business as well. IBM uses MQTT as uh, the standard. MQTT is an open source, open standard, and uh, was invented by IBM, but now it's an Oasis standard since 2000 something. And that's basically the IoT platform. So we are capable of connecting devices from more than 250 vendors out of the box because we have a library there. But in addition to that, we are supporting MQTT. So you can basically connect everything which speaks MQTT or HTTP to, to, the, to the cloud. Okay. The IBM Watson IoT platform is a distributed fault tolerant MQTT broker, which supports publish subscribe paradigm, which actually means that you only broadcast data to topics from the IoT devices and applications decide what to subscribe to. And on the other hand, you can send commands out to the IoT devices and the IoT device itself can decide what to subscribe to. We have APIs for managing devices and also for getting data in and out of the platform. And today, in, the, in this 30 minutes, uh, I want to concentrate on uh, analytics applications and specifically to uh, deep learning. Okay, so that's just an example of uh, three lines of code necessary to hook up a Raspberry Pi to the cloud. As you can see, you can read a temperature value, sensor value, for example, in one line of code. You transform it as a JSON object, and there's only one line of code necessary to publish it. As you can see, there are no IP addresses or ports necessary, so it's a fault-tolerant system, which basically has failover systems, so you don't care about any server endpoints. So it's distributed on more than 50 data centers worldwide. And you can see quality of service equals two. That means exactly once guaranteed delivery, so it's uh, some sort of transactional guarantee is what you have there. If you want to know how that works, we are proud to announce that we have the first non-academic course on Coursera which explains this all to you. And I also want to announce that I'm currently building the second one. It's about uh, exploratory data analysis on IoT data. It's also on Coursera uh, starting from the 9th of January, and I, I'm the instructor there. So that basically is uh, the central nervous system of IoT. And today, in my 30 minutes, I want to talk a bit on the brain. So there are two flavors of machine learning. One is machine learning on historic data, and one is machine learning on real-time data. Actually, you have to use both, but I just tell you the pros and the cons of both, okay? So the pros of online learning is that you have low storage costs because you actually don't store data. And you can update your model in real-time. So at any point in time, you have uh, up-to-date a scored model running uh, in, in that process. But uh, not all algorithms are supporting incremental data processing. And also, therefore, a lot of software packages are, are lacking that support. In addition, you cannot improve your algorithm later because you've lost all your data. And finally, 
the compute power has to be in line with the data rate because if your data rate is uh, higher than your compute power, you will start to lose data. On the other hand, if you are on historic data algorithms, then uh, all algorithms are supporting it because all those are basically built for batch processing. Therefore, there exists an abundance of open source and, and closed source software packages ranging from R and Pandas and SkyPy and, and, and so forth. And uh, you can improve your model or your algorithm later because you still have all the data. And uh, you, your computing power hasn't to be in line with the data rate because you're doing batch processing. But on the other hand, you have high storage costs because you have to store everything and uh, your model is not always up to date. You are updating it in, in batches. And uh, basically you have to do both. And in order to do both, there is something called uh, the Lambda architecture, which supports stream and batch processing. And that's something uh, you have to use uh, in often, okay? Uh, that's a placeholder for a traditional class of algorithms. That's the ARIMA model, which is a time series forecasting model, which uses regression, but actually it performs very bad compared to the new class of algorithms, which are based on deep learning. So those are three Google trend charts. One is on deep learning starting 2003. Also one on Apache Spark starting, uh, sorry, 2013. And one on Hadoop, which was kind of the uh, predecessor of Apache Spark, which started 2007. So I give you a very, very brief introduction into neural networks because it will help you in understand the second talk better in case you are not aware of what neural networks are. In case you are, then the next three minutes are boring for you. Sorry for that. So basically that's a three-layer feed-forward network, a very basic one. You have three input neurons that represent, for example, three columns in a table, which you are using for training. That's also called uh, three, uh, uh, three dimensions. And then you have, for example, two output neurons, and that, for example, can be used for binary classification. Okay. And you basically, what you are doing is you are training that network and you are updating the connection strength between the neurons. Once they are trained, then this whole system is nothing else than a mapping or a mathematical function from A to B. So you are learning basically mathematical functions. And that's uh, one single neuron. You have upstream neurons as input and you basically have a weight where you adjust the strength of influence of each neuron on that particular neuron and you have a activation function which adds non-linearity to the transformation function because otherwise such a single neuron is nothing else than a, a regression model okay and the regression model is, is linear and if you add an activation function you add lin non-linearity to each neuron and therefore you also add non-linearity to the whole neural network. If you stack such a neural network, you get a deep neural network. And the deep neural network basically is doing something very important. It can automatically learn features and feature transformations for you. That means you don't have to do this by hand, which is a classical day-to-day -day task of a data scientist. You have to transform your features. But a neural network, given you have enough data, can learn those features automatically for you by itself. One famous example is the convolutional neural network, which is inspired by the visionary system of the human brain and basically does nothing else than at the first layers learning some simple structures like line circles and rectangles. And the further you go up the layers, the more concrete are the patterns the neural network is recognizing up to a layer where you recognize faces, cars, elephants, or chairs, for example. You can also use this for uh, creating a generative model, which is basically a model which learns, in this case, the style of an artist and applies it to a sample image and basically redraws the picture based on, uh, on that. The model is, um, so the, the output is basically an optimization function and that's trained using stochastic gradient descent 
and that picture basically which you are seeing on the right hand side is one local minima of that optimization optimization program problem so um, this is another example where the inventor of this algorithm basically used the picture of uh, Golden Gate Bridge and applied it to various styles of different artists. And one startup in Switzerland, which is running on the IBM cloud because we have very, uh, very, very powerful GPU cards from NVIDIA. Uh, it's NVIDIA Tesla M M60 cards with a Maxwell chipset. So they are basically running a B2C uh, offering where you can basically upload your picture and select the style and have that painted for you. So one final statement on feedforward networks, they are capable of learning any mathematical function given you have enough training data. But one thing feedforward networks are not very good at is um, remember or, or training on sequences. So speech or character sequences or audio. Therefore, you can add some sort of memory to a neural network. And one uh, way of doing that is introducing feedback loops. And therefore, the neural network can, can remember some short temporal state. But you can push this further and actually add memory into each neuron. And then you get something like a long short-term short memory network. And those are very, very powerful. So those can be used and trained, for example, with Shakespeare literature, and those can generate Shakespeare literature. So what you're seeing here is a text which has been generated by a LSTM network after it has been trained with Shakespeare literature. And the neural network doesn't understand anything about English or sentences or words. It's only being trained using character sequences. And as you can see, it at least to me looks a bit like Shakespeare. The same you can do with LaTeX code and generate mathematical publications. You can do it with a C kernel source code and generating C source code. And a more practical example is you can outperform all anomaly detection algorithms in time series analytics um, using those LSTM networks. So that's uh, one example of this. And you can also use those LSTM networks for forecasting. So that's another publication here where you see that the state-of-the-art algorithm, which is uh, kernelized regression, you see it at the bottom, has an error of 8.3%. If you are using a frequency neural network, but which basically means you have a normal feedforward network, but before you apply the data, you apply fast Fourier transformation to transform the data from the time to the frequency domain, you get 6 or 7%. If you uh, get rid of that FFT, get rid of the fast Fourier transformation and use the time data, the original time data, but use the deep feed forward network, you are uh, at 5.9%. And that's very interesting because you learn a better feature representation using a neural network than fast Fourier transformation is giving you. Okay, That's a very important message. And at the bottom, you see a deep recurrent neural network. I think that's a typo because they actually are using a LSTM. And they have been going down to 2.8% of error. And uh, you see also in the plot that the red line, that's the predicted data, and the blue line, that's the actual data, they are nearly the same. So you see uh, that uh, LSTM networks are really catching up in that space as well. So a one a very, very important sentence of, of this whole talk is uh, that the LSTM is Turing complete. I still have a typo here. You, uh, you don't have a, a O in Turing. Sorry for that. Sorry, Alan Turing. <laughs> but um, Turing complete means you can basically implement uh, everything which you are implementing on a normal machine in any programming language with the LSTM. So the LSTM can learn an algorithm for you given you have enough data. Okay. Uh, there is a catch with neural networks. They are very uh, computationally intensive, uh, especially during training, but also during scoring. Scoring means you apply basically the neural network to data. And uh, 2009, uh, Google had a Google Brain with two uh, 16,000 CPU cores. And 2016, you have the same computing power than the Google Brain had in one uh, NVIDIA Titan M60 GPU card. 
And that's one you can, for example, rent in the IBM cloud for $1 per hour. Um, and then next year we will introduce a new ASIC, application specific integrated circuit, which is called IBM 2 North, which can run neural networks on chip. Okay. And uh, it only consumes four watts. And we are currently building a cluster with 4,000 of those chips. And that means we have 4 billion neurons and 1 trillion synapses in that cluster. And in contrast, the human brain has, has 100 billion neurons and 100 trillion synapses. So we are catching up. Of course, the human brain works different than uh, artificial. Just to give you an idea about what we have here. Okay. That's uh, one architecture we are proposing for such large scale assistive uh, deep learning. We uh, have bare metal machines, which, which are quite powerful. And we have those NVIDIA Tesla M60 GPU cars on it. We have some sort of distributed file system for the data. And then uh, uh, running Apache Spark. And inside Apache Spark, we run a library called Deep Learning for J. And to my knowledge, Deep Learning for J is the only library supporting all sorts of neural network topologies, uh, which can score and also train models in parallel fashion on Apache Spark and also can use GPUs out of the box. And that's because Deep Learning for J uses a library which is called ND4J, which is the Java equivalent to NumPy, but that's automatically running on uh, GPUs as well. You just have to change one parameter in a Maven pom.xml file and it automatically runs on, on the GPU card. So that brings us to such an architecture. So we have a stream of MQTT events from IoT devices. So it's a IoT specific architecture, of course. We have Spark streaming and we can apply those uh, uh, model training on the stream, on the fly, on the parallel cluster. Um, so now this brings me to uh, exa an example. For the sake of time, I will skip one thing. Uh, I have a little demo, but I can post the link in the, in the meetup where you all now could participate and start an application on, on a smartphone, which reads accelerometer data, and that's then being sent to the cloud using the MQTT JavaScript library. Uh, it streams into an OSQL database and using Apache Spark, we can basically analyze uh, who of you was shaking the best, which means who has generated the most energy. But for sake of time, because I want to give stage for the next talk as soon as possible, only one uh, practical example. So I am uh, uh, currently working on an industry 4.0 use case for predictive maintenance and quality, and that's the bearing and you want to monitor such bearings in order to predict if they are failing. And what you then simply can do is you can attach a 50 cent vibration sensor, which is nothing else than an accelerometer, which you also have in your smartphone on top of the bearing, which tells you the vibration in each axis. And since it's pretty hard to get real uh, data on this, I've in the meanwhile, I've found two open data sources, but I haven't used them so far. But uh, in order to, to get the data, I have written a little test data generator. And that test gen data generator is using the so-called Lawrence attractor model. Okay? And the Lawrence attractor model is um, um, a physical model. And Lawrence was the inventor of chaos theory. And uh, basically, I will show you how to actually um, write a neural network which is capable of detecting anomalies in a chaotic system. I'm just double checking if everything is still working because, yeah, I'm just, yeah, yeah it's okay. So every, everybody's still there. So, uh, so that's, that's uh, the healthy state. I can change parameters and that's the non-healthy state. And you see there is a bit more of energy. So the diagram you are seeing here is the so-called phase plot. And the phase plot is a way of visualizing three dimensions plus the time, because basically what you see is the line is basically indicating the time. And you see that the system is traversing through that three-dimensional space uh, on, a, on a time basis. And it basically oscillates between two stable states, uh, in both cases, in the broken and in the and in the healthy state. 
for those who are not familiar with such a plot, this uh, time series plot or uh, a run chart, you can also see the three vibration dimensions and also see that the system is oscillating between two semi-stable states. That's the healthy case, that's the broken case. And uh, what I do now is for writing a classifier or an anomaly detector, I transform it to the frequency domain using fast Fourier transformation. So that's the healthy state and the broken state. You see in the broken state, you see more frequency bands present and we also see more overall energy. And that you could, for example, use to, to create a normal state-of-the-art classifier, but then you need labeled data. And I will show you now how to use unsupervised learning using a deep learning autoencoder. So this is a deep learning autoencoder, which basically is trained in the following way. You show the neural network the actual data on both sides. So you will show the neural network the same value on the left hand and on the right hand side as input and as output. And there's one catch in the middle, you have a bottleneck. You have far less neurons than you have on the input or output. So later we will see in my example, I have 3000 input neurons on the left and 3000 output neurons on the right hand side for uh, my, my 3000 frequency bands, but only two in the middle. And that actually means you get rid of all the noise and basically this autoencoder will be trained and learn how normal data looks like. And after you show the neural network data which it hasn't seen before, so basically in this case frequency bands which it hasn't seen before, then uh, the neural network will have a harder time in reconstructing that data and that gives you a higher reconstruction error. So what you basically do is you train the neural network and you reconstruct the data and um, afterwards if you show the neural network data which it hasn't seen before then you get a higher reconstruction error okay let me show this example to you and then i will hand over to the second talk okay so let's go to a browser i will show that to you in a cloud system of course and since I'm working for IBM, of course, I will use an IBM system, no worries. Um, it's basically an Apache Spark as a service, plus a Python Jupyter notebook. And in there, I will use um, two libraries, Python libraries. One is called Piano, which is a deep learning, a low-level deep learning library. And the other one is called Lasagne, which is running on top of Piano. And uh, since the lasagna has multiple layers, also the neural network we are building has multiple layers. So there are only two lines of code necessary to install uh, lasagna. You first need to install, which includes piano. And second, you install lasagna. And then you basically just import uh, some classes. So let's go in edit mode. So in the background, Apache Spark instance is being uh, started. Therefore, it takes a couple of seconds. And now this notebook is uh, in, in edit mode. So I will now import those uh, classes. You can see here as a dense layer and input layer classes here. And now I will actually get the data from the test data generator. And then I will plot it. So this will take a while. A star indicates that the process is running. And here you see the pattern which we have seen before. So that's the, the run chart for the, for the healthy state. And let's set this test data generator to generate broken data. And then you see the pattern for broken data. And what we now do is we apply FFT to the data. So I can make this notebook available if you are interested. Uh, so if you apply FFT on the healthy data, you see this spectrum. And if you apply FFT on the broken data, you will see that spectrum, which contains more frequency bands and also more energy. And now it comes to the interesting part. We will actually build our neural network. 
So we are using uh, Lasagne here, which uses uh, Theano under the hood. So we are creating an input layer. So we are actually building now the, the outdoor encoder. That's the input layer with 3,000 neurons. Then we have a hidden layer with only two neurons. And then we have an output layer with, again, 3,000 neurons. That's our autoencoder. That's the activation function. It's TANH, which adds nonlinearity, as already said. And uh, in, the, in the hidden layer, we use sigmoid. That's another activation function. And basically, um, maybe my next uh, speaker will have uh, more insights about that. But basically, for me, it's trial and error, which combination performs best. Also the learning rate, so that's the amount of shift all the parameters are updated on each training iteration is, is a very important parameter, uh, which is specified here, for example, it's 0 0.01. Um, so what I'm basically doing here is, let's rerun that to be sure that run. So um, what I'm basically doing here is I'm training now. So that means I uh, do it uh, a thousand, uh, ten thousand times. So what I do is, I every thousand times I will uh, print out uh, the reconstruction error, and that's basically uh, decreasing, hopefully. So that's always the the, the first goal, and it's uh, often pretty hard to achieve. That if you train a neural network, that the reconstruction error or the or the error or the, the loss of the whole neural network is, is decreasing constantly, linearly. So uh, that's basically the training function. And as you can see here, I apply the same data on the input and on the output. And train means actually it will update the parameters on, of the neural network and basically get better over time. So let's have a look how this works. So you see here the reconstruction error is decreasing until we stop after a couple of iterations, which is uh, 10,000 in this case. And uh, it's not perfect. I would have expected a better one, but at least we are uh, um, decreasing here. So that's on the healthy data. And now we do the following. We switch to the broken case and we call predict instead of um, instead of train, that means the parameters are fixed now, but we are basically scoring now um, our data using the neural network, outer encoder, and you see here with the broken data, since this data or these frequency bands haven't been seen before, uh, the reconstruction error is high, and if we rerun it in a healthy condition and we also call the predict function, then we still have the lower reconstruction error. So that's a simple example how to create a feed forward autoencoder. And I will just show you one thing where we are here. So if you go back to that uh, publication, so it's the frequency neural network, which I've implemented here, which is uh, giving you 6% uh, or 7% of error. So the next step would be to, to add additional layers. And of course, after that, I have to create a LSTM network, which is also possible in Fiano and Lasagne. And just as a last thing, which I want to show here, is uh, that's basically uh, the simulator. So that's something you can also use. Uh, I can make that available. It sends data, uh, M uh, MQTT data via cloud uh, to a system called Node-RED, which is an open source data flow editor uh, using uh, Node.js, which you can install uh, very easily. And you see here the data is running through an MQTT message broker and basically is stored in a database. And I will use that for, for further resist parallel analysis using Apache Spark later. Okay, so let's take two or three minutes for questions and then I, I hand over to the, to the next talk. So I think if you want to, it's best you use the chat window and I can unmute your line. Uh, give me one second, I have to check where to do this. Uh, here we are. So I'm in the chat window now and
I will just for those who are coming and going, I will just uh, share the word file again. So, so are there any questions? You can raise your hand in in the tool, or you can also uh, put a message in the chat bot. I just wait for another 30 seconds and then I will hand over. Okay, so uh, then let me introduce our next speaker. It's Boyan. He is uh, born in uh, Slovenia and he uh, finished his PhD using uh, or, uh, a thesis about border pair methods for learning of neural network and that's basically also the talk uh, which he will present now. He is uh, a R&D engineer at Spirostroy Computer, maybe you can pronounce it better later, and he's already 10 years a teacher at the Electronics High School in uh, Tuesday, four years of uh, assistant professor at the Un University of Maribor, seven years a lecturer at the Higher Vocational College in Tuesday, and uh, three years lecturer at the College of Tuesday on Artificial Intelligence, and he doing research in voice recognition with neural networks, hexapod gate control on neural networks, pipe propagation algorithm for learning neural networks, which is something we will present later, and also the border pairs method for learning neural networks. So uh, welcome, and now we can just share your screen. And so I think I have to make you presenter. Give me one second. Uh, So now you should be able to share. Can you see the share screen button? Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Can you can you see the button to share the screen? Uh huh. Uh uh, screen button, yes. Share screen, yeah. Can you click on the yeah. share screen button, please? Yeah, I, I have, and okay. You are ah, sharing okay. your screen. Perfect, I see your screen. So you can start your presentation. <clears throat> Thank you for uh, the introduction, Mr. Kinsler. Dear listeners, I wish you a warm welcome. I'm glad that you have responded in such large number. Today we will talk about two new algorithms for learning of feed-forward neural networks. A few words about motivation. Uh, the development of neural networks takes place in waves. We are currently witnessing the spring of neural networks called a deep learning. In many areas, neural networks overcame the whole of humanity, chess, Go, computer Go, games, Jeopardy, and so on. Uh, I'm half century old, and neural networks are the same age. I met uh, her a quarter century ago. Back propagation was her name. This was time before the internet, and then happened love at the first sight. Romance lasted seven years, and after that, I have realized that back propagation have also some disadvantages. She is slow, unreliable, 
to mention only two of them. Few years ago I met two young ladies about which I talk today. Uh, B propagation is uh, the first of the two algorithms about which we will talk today. Uh, first few words about basic idea. Uh, we decompose MLP into separate layers, what we uh, see here on the figure. Uh, what's the problem now? We have now to determine inner desired values that uh, uh, was no uh, what was uh, not uh, case in, uh, by back propagation, and so we can now learn individual layers, layer by layer, uh, where is no more local minima problem. A uh, few words about time complexity, if we have many layers together, then uh, each layer gives exponential bigger time for learning. Uh, for example, if we have uh, 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 a value equal 10, each layer make time 10 times longer. Uh, also one layer 10 uh, unit of time, two layers 100 units, three layers 1000 units, and so on. Here we have separate layers. Every layer, each layer have only 10 units of time. So one layer mean 10 units of time, two layers 20, three layers 30, and so on. Uh, so with big number of layers, we, uh, we have uh, uh, much faster uh, we, we do uh, our learning much faster. Uh, description of uh, this new algorithm. Uh, here we have many layers, which is no more a problem. Uh, because of linear time complexity. Uh, Second thing, the gradualness, a single layer makes small change because of many layers, so input and output of single layer are very similar. Uh, initialization, uh, W matrix is very similar to, to I matrix, to identity matrix, so W init is very good if we, uh, 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 it is very good if we start with W equal identity matrix. Uh, because if start already uh, very near of the goal, we we uh, we have second uh, reason to uh, uh, that we need only few uh, small number of epochs. And this uh, algorithm is so also uh, biologically plausible, but this is at the time a uh, climb without the proof. Uh, when uh, neuronal, neuronal network grow, then we have at the first uh, uh, time uh, only one synapses, which is strong, and thereafter uh, grow uh, another uh, synapses, which are uh, much more weaker, and uh, and that is then similar to the identity matrix where we have in one uh, row one zero and uh, in many very small values. Uh, X or example of uh, with big, uh, with our big propagation uh, algorithm, uh, I have here two cases. In the first case, I firstly make uh, uh, output column double, 
So that is number of inputs and outputs equal. And then we seek inner values so that are between input and output values. Uh, in the first row we see 0, 0, go to the 0, 0, uh, be, uh, value between these two values is also 0, 0. In the second row we see values 0 and 1, and our goal is 1, 1. So middle value is uh, uh, half and 1. Second case of X or example, we leave here only one output, but uh, uh, this uh, uh, one uh, output, uh, this uh, problem is too hard for only one layer with one neuron. So we put uh, between one hidden layer, uh, which uh, uh, has a few uh, 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 values, uh, one uh, in output column, column, we have two ones, logic, logical, logical ones, and here we have two columns with only one logical ones. Uh, so the problem is decomposed in the two smaller problems. And that uh, both in both cases is uh, uh, problem solved in only three, four, maybe five epochs, which is much much faster than basic backpropagation method. Uh, another uh, example is gender classification from picture uh, input layer. Uh, is here um, uh, each pixel on the picture is one input value of the neural network uh, inner values are uh, one shade darker for man and one shade brighter for girl uh, for women uh, uh, there can be also more hidden layers, um, and then go this uh, 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 this uh, 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 this transformation go then slower. Uh, the out output goal is by women uh, totally white picture uh, by man totally dark picture if we have more uh, classes than two then we make uh, 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 darker or brighter only part of picture uh, for example if we have NIST problem there we have uh, 10 uh, class classes uh, uh, each class uh, 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 for, uh, for uh, one class for each uh, digit then we uh, make bri brighter or uh, darker only one tenth of the picture. <clears throat> Advantages of big propagation method. It is very similar to the back propagation, so it's easy to understand and implement for people with back propagation experience. It is many times faster than back propagation is much more reliable than backpropagation. Uh, single layer do not have problems with local minima, so this method is much more reliable. It is also suitable for combining with other methods. So we can use one layer with or two or three with backpropagation algorithm and then and then we can continue with other uh, layers with other algorithms and totally other methods. Uh, it is similar to support vector machine and auto encoder, uh, which uh, uh, has been mentioned uh, by first uh, 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 in first talk. A uh, few words about auto encoder and uh, by propagation comparison. <coughs> if we have by propagation, then we learn 
one by one layer, one after another. When we have autoencoder, then we learn two layer and then we remove one and then we add two layer and learn them and again remove one. So we make two steps forward, one step backward. And uh, only the the last layer by autoencoder is uh, is uh, then uh, significant for classification. By by propagation method, all layers are uh, 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 make a few steps uh, for uh, uh, for the uh, for the classification which also uh, happened in the last layer. Another my method, which was uh, also my uh, thesis, thesis uh, on my PhD, uh, <clears throat> this uh, um, method called border pairs method. We will see very soon why that name uh, basic idea here is that we have uh, uh, to divide uh, with borderline each pattern which are near the borderline. And these pat uh, patterns near borderline are border pairs uh, members, which are shown here on the picture with dashed line. <coughs> Uh, a few words about uh, uh, definition of the border pair. Uh, if we have two circles, uh, which uh, where is uh, one circle in the center and another one on the rand, uh, so we get two circles, and in the middle we get uh, intersection. If this intersection is empty, and patterns are different of different classes, then is this a border pair. Uh, when is some third uh, pattern in between, then is this no more border pair. What happened in the first layer of uh, this neural network? Uh, we have here a picture where we have two classes, blue one and the red one, uh, and here we have three border pairs. First, second, and third border pair. So, from uh, 14 patterns, we use only uh, six of them. Uh, so, we uh, at the very beginning remove uh, approximately half patterns without any uh, uh, trouble. Uh, with, uh, this remove pattern done do not apply on the uh, on the re uh, end result. It's equal good with or, or without uh, these patterns learning. Uh, two linear lines can separate the, all these border pairs. So this means that we need only two neurons in the first layer. So we get areas which are all homogeneous. Uh, in, in each part of a picture, we see only one color of patterns. One uh, area with blue patterns and three area with red patterns. What happened in the second layer? first layer is giving out two binary values, A and B, to the second layer. Uh, red patterns was in three areas, so we still have three red patterns here in this picture. And blue, all three blue uh, border pairs members are in the same area, so we became uh, only one blue uh, 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 pattern here in the uh, in, in input space of the second layer, uh, and uh, so we uh, we have 
only few patterns uh, uh, only. Uh, and these patterns are so uh, arranged that only uh, one linear uh, uh, line is needed to separate one class from the other. So uh, when is uh, only one uh, neuron needed, then is over with learning process. So we need here two neurons in the first layer and only one neuron in the second layer and learning is finished. If in the second layer is not one uh, linear uh, line enough to separate all uh, all patterns, then we repeat the story, the same story as in the second layer, until we get only one uh, linear line in the our picture. <coughs> Advantages uh, of a border pairs method. This method is constructive. It, fin it finds near minimal construction in every case uh, during the learning process by by itself. We don't need to guess how many layers, how many neurons. Uh, second advantage is that everything happened in only one step. No more epochs. 100% reliability. reliability reliable. Uh, in every case, we get uh, a good learning result. It is online suitable. We can learn uh, this uh, with this method also online uh, 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 <clears throat> that means uh, our neural network is on the duty and is uh, at the same time uh, learn to be even better and better after each new case of data difficulty prediction is another advantage uh, even before uh, the learning has really started, we can estimate uh, how hard it will be learning. Uh, here are two possible scenarios. Uh, the first one, if, pat uh, if patterns are noisy, then we have big number of border pairs or uh, or in uh, in second scenario, if uh, if is uh, if our uh, uh, learning uh, rules very complex, then we have also a big number of border pairs. Uh, Iris classification, uh, where we have four-dimensional input space and 150 patterns of three classes. Uh, we remove uh, ab about 98% patterns before uh, before uh, learning started, and we already know that uh, learning will be uh, very easy. Noise reduction is another one advantage. Uh, it is only meaningful to remove noise from those patterns which are involved in border pairs. In, uh, in this case, a border pairs member are shifted to the nearest patterns of the same class that is not involved in border pairs. Uh, if I explain this on the example, this, uh, uh, this blue pattern is border pair members and his nearest uh, non-member pair uh, 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 colic is here, so uh, the noise, uh, removing of noise will be uh, uh, so that we uh, move this pattern a little bit to the to the to this one pattern. 
and uh, when we do this with all patterns the gap between uh, border pairs is getting uh, uh, wider clustering uh, clustering is uh, the first layer make clusters of patterns of the same class. This is done automatically without any additional effort. And uh, maybe the last one advantage uh, uh, rules extraction. Uh, uh, first layer uh, which uh, da where is done. Uh, uh, analog digital conversion make uh, find rules uh, and uh, in the uh, and then we have only logical functions in the second third and uh, uh, next layers of the neural networks uh, uh, every neuron in the first layer uh, uh, is finding uh, one rule uh, So, thank you for attention. If you have any question, I'm willing to answer them. Okay, so if you have any questions, please type uh, or click on the raise your hand symbol on the top of the screen and I will unmute your line. You can also type your questions in the chat. You can enter the chat if you click on the symbol on the left hand side below the person symbol. So I will read the question of Alexander. How yes. do you do any regularization? So for example prevent overfitting. My guess is to just stop at some arbitrary depth like in a decision tree. Uh, um. Uh, this met both of these methods are uh, uh, good for uh, overfitting um, uh, because uh, you use always straight lines to separate uh, 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 patterns uh, near of the border. Is this answer or uh, or uh, should I uh, answer? Uh, uh, something more so Alexander I have unmuted your line if you like you can uh, also also talk can anyone hear me yes yes like okay all right My microphone uh, so yeah maybe I did catch it but uh, if it's just um, a continuous process to divide the the, the, the space into more and more layers. Uh, light layers basically so when do you basically stop because if you don't stop you you would end up always with a perfect uh -huh. uh, uh, space uh -huh. uh, partition space right so and then i would s somehow see that it's very easy to overfit yes uh, i i begin with small number of of flares and when is everything all right then it's nothing to do and uh, if if uh, I cannot be, uh, become a good result, then, then I add few layers to get better results. Right, right. And then, uh, do you have any uh, heuristics how um, on some data sets where you uh, where you stopped before a maximum before you had achieved 100% separation? And it was uh, still working well. Uh, I don't have so such heuristic. Okay, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, very interesting. You're welcome. <laughs> so, any other questions? Please raise your hand or put it in the chat window. Sorry. Double check if somebody raised his hand. No, nobody raised his hand. And the chat window. Ah, I have a 
question from Guido. Nice to see you live. I think you know Guido. Uh, how does separate learning of neurons and joining of these layers work? I will also unmute uh, Guido's line if he wants to add something to that. Give me one second. So Guido, you are unmuted. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. Guido. I don't hear anything. No, me too. So I, I read I re read the question for you, so maybe you yeah. can answer it. So how does separate learning of neurons and joining of these layers work? Separate of neurons and joining of layers. Uh, uh, is this question is about first or second uh, algorithm? I guess it's about the first, but uh, maybe Guido can type it in the chat. Yeah, let's assume it's for the first one. Uh -huh. How does this work? Uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, the answer is in the example of picture. Uh, uh, I uh, separate every every layer separate little bit more pictures uh, patterns of one class f from uh, uh, patterns from another class. Uh, I uh, I arise one pixel for one first class and I and I arise another pixel for second class. So uh, patterns go uh, uh, further away. Gap between patterns is uh, in e in each layer a little bit bigger, and and in few layers we have so big gap that we can use only one neuron, only one uh, hyperplane. To separate all of the patterns. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions? I don't see any hands raised. And I check in the chat. Uh, no. So, last chance. Any questions? Please raise your hand or Type it in the chat, and otherwise we will close the session in one or two minutes. Okay, if you have comments, you can also comment on the Meetup page. I will put the recording also there. Uh -huh. And uh, I will only say, I uh, may I say something? Of course. Yes. Um, uh, uh, results of my research are all published on ResearchGate of, uh, under my name. Uh, uh, okay, maybe maybe you can you can you can post that uh, link as a comment on the Meetup page or uh -huh. send it to yeah. me and I will put it there. Yeah, uh, right now or later? How you like? Uh, later. We have another question. Yeah. Okay, we have another question from Guido. How much faster is border pairs? I would say compared to back backpropagation in in terms of learning cycles. Yeah, uh, this is uh, very uh, hard to answer for me. Uh, while why uh, because I have uh, done uh, my backpropagation experiments in MATLAB, uh, and and this my uh, MATLAB. Uh, uh, software MATLAB code was was not optimized for uh, for speed. Uh, my code was was very uh, very uh, unoptimized. Uh, but I think Guido uh, is asking is asking not for overall performance. He's asking uh, about how many epochs basically you need. You you mentioned that you need less epochs for training. So do you have a number for this? Uh, uh, in border pairs method is only one epoch, only uh, always. Uh, by only one epoch, okay. Yeah, only one step. In one step is everything done. And and how is it in, in B, B propagation? In B propagation, 
is few epoch because uh, we start with with W matrix which is very near of goal because uh, our uh, we start with uh, identity matrix and our goal is always near of identity matrix because layer to, uh, is uh, input and output are very similar because we have so many layers uh, and we gradually uh, uh, change uh, desired value from layer to layer till output. Okay, Guido, is that answering your question? Almost. <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe you can uh, catch up with him personally. Okay. So, uh, any other questions before we close? I don't see any raised hands. And I don't see any more chat messages. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much for your time and also for the attendees. Thank you very much for joining. And I hope we see some more presentations uh, in the near future on, on that channel. And uh, thanks so much, everybody. Okay, all the best and have a nice evening. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye. bye.